They come in all shapes, sizes. Big. He's big. He's this big. Children surprise us all the time with what they come up with. <laughs> a shark? This idea that something can be real and fantasy all at the same time, that's an amazing capacity. We've got an image in our heads of a child sitting alone, talking to some unseen entity. The child was shy and maybe a little out of touch with reality. Definitely stuck in their own world. Children who were lonely, um, <laughs> kind of at best, or had some sort of psychopathology at worst. Something has gone wrong. A lot of times when imaginary friends show up in a movie, it's time to take the child to the psychiatrist. These cultural representations of children with imaginary companions put a fantasy in our heads. And for a long time, professional psychiatric research backed it up. A lot of the research came from clinical studies of children who were having problems, and it was discovered that, yes, they did have imaginary friends. So having an imaginary friend became associated with having some kind of difficulty. In fact, when developmental psychologist Dr. Marjorie Taylor first began her work in the field in the 1990s, there wasn't a lot of research on this phenomenon. You know, when I first started out, I wanted to find out who's the typical kid who has one and what's the typical imaginary friend like? And it was hard to pin it down. For example, how do you even define what an imaginary companion is? Deciding if we're going to count something as being an imaginary friend or not is extremely messy. Some people only want to talk about the invisible variety, but that means if you had a little boy like Calvin from Calvin and Hobbes, that child would be classified as someone who did not have an imaginary friend, and we know that that's not true. Objects can be imbued with all kinds of personality and character, and children can listen to what those objects have to say. I heard once about a child who had a very close relationship with one of those little I don't know, four or six ounce cans of tomato paste. Tell me, where'd you go? I don't have ice in the back of my can. Oh, there you are, buddy, I missed you. When it's so easy to carry around that way, why not? You know, they were good pals. And then there's the problem of unreliable interview subjects. Talking to a child about an imaginary companion, you have no idea what's gonna come out. And her shoes hide my shoes. I see. They'll tell you something and you think, what are they talking about? Blue, red, black, black, black. No, blue, gray, yellow, black. Blue, gray, yellow, and black, okay. Typically, developmental psychologists like Dr. Tracy Gleason get their data from fidgety or overly excited interviewees. You have said, do you have an imaginary companion? And they think, what a great idea. And so they say, yes, yes, I do. And they'll report on some imaginary companion that they're making up right on the spot. Do you have any friends like that? No? No. I can't play. So researchers conduct multiple interviews with a child and their parents, just to be sure the information is accurate. In the process, Dr. Gleason, Dr. Taylor, and other researchers have discovered that the phenomenon occurs more frequently than anybody could have imagined. He's actually this height. If you follow children up to the age of seven, it's probably in the neighborhood of 60-65%. If you only want to include the invisible types, it's more like 38%. Similar results have been observed across a diversity of ethnic groups. In fact, when the behavior is so common, it's hard to pin down who is the stereotypical child who has one. There's really not much difference between children who do have imaginary friends and children who don't. But they do have some shared attributes. Girls are somewhat more likely to have imaginary friends than boys. Children who create imaginary companions really like pretend play, they like fantasy, and they also are very sociable, they like people. They are less shy, so it's exactly the opposite of the stereotype. If these are social kids, why do they need to create imaginary relationships? I think there are a lot of different reasons, but the main one is just because the child has some free time, and so they just invent a friend to talk to. Do you have any imaginary friends? You do. How many? What are their names? Alice and Jewel. Oh. They're twins. Do they look like you? Um, yeah. They, do but, they... But they have pink skin. Can 
I see them? Yeah. They're just right behind me of the pillow. See? Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> They're really good hiders. They were hiding back there the whole time? What, what sort of stuff do they like to do with you? Play games. What games do you guys play? Hide and go seek. Oh, and are they good at hiding? Yeah, because they're so small, I don't know even know where they are. I like to think the stereotypical reason you create an imaginary companion is because it's fun. And why wouldn't you? Because, you know, then you have this person that you can interact with anytime, anywhere. If you have created this character and, and you are thinking things over, you're mulling something over that's going on in your life, you can talk to your imaginary friend and imagine what the character would say in response. One time, Mommy and Daddy hurt their feelings. Oh, what did Mommy and Daddy say to hurt their feelings? They said, you're really, really tiny. So we're not supposed so, to just talk about how big they are. Because that hurts their feelings? Yes. As for classifying the imaginary characters themselves. They can be just about anything. Dipper was a flying dolphin that lived on a faraway star. I like Bainter, the little boy lived in the light. You can't see him because he's white. So many different types. It just blows my mind at times. With such diversity, how is a researcher supposed to make sense of it all? I was frustrated by trying to do that, and I realized, no, the finding is the diversity. That's the finding. That has resulted in really a deep respect for the developing imagination of children in general. Many of these children form deep attachments to their companions. They love them. I mean, that love is real. And I was curious, do they think that they actually exist somewhere? They certainly behave like they're real. They're sitting there talking to you. You're listening carefully, you're writing down what they say. And at some point they want to clarify, you know it's just a little pretend girl. I just made her up. You know it's not real. So what exactly are they thinking? On the next episode of The Real Guide to Imaginary Companions, 